Caro, can you share your screen? Yes. While you do that, I do the very brief introduction. Caro is a recent, uh, I would say high profile hire from MIT to Basel slash Zurich ETH, the BSSE. Um, she has a strong machine learning background, but I've been applying some of her latent space techniques to single cell uh, um, uh, genomics. And I've been particularly interested, of course, in her modeling of perturbations, but then also optimal transport. And today it's gonna to be about multi-domain data integration. So I think a fantastic uh, kickoff. Looking forward to your presentation, Carl. Thanks for joining. Thank you very much, Fabian, and in particular uh, for the invitation to speak here. Um, so let me just get started with the kinds of questions that I want to talk about here in this conference. Um, so, you know, one of the main challenges, I think, if we think broadly about single cell um, biology is, and in particular, if we think about time, is that, you know, obtaining single cell data is often destructive to the cell, right? And here you can think about RNA-seq data or also imaging data where you often, you know, have to fix the cell beforehand. And so in particular, if you think about, you know, and what we just saw in the introduction by Fabian, right? If you think about wanting to say something about a particular cell and how it will evolve over time, well, you're just not going to be able to see this cell over time since all these measurements are destructive, right? So you'll be able to get to see one cell at time point one, and then you cannot see the same cell again at time point two, but what you can do is see a different cell from the same population of cells at time point two. And similar questions also arise and, and you know, I mean, and these are the kinds of questions I want to talk about is also in terms of different data modalities, right? So this happens for RNA-seq, it also happens for imaging data and very often still now because it's destructive for, for these cells, you can still not do the different measurements in the same cell. Right, so same problem, I want to get um, the RNA-seq and say a DAPI stained image of a cell. Well, I have to decide for a given cell, do I get its RNA-seq profile or do I get its DAPI staining? I cannot do both because both of these measurements are destructive to the cell. And a similar questions is also when you think about perturbations and you know, basically this is also a time question, right? So um, I have a particular perturbation that I care about. Um, I want to understand what this particular cell does under the perturbation. Well, again, you can either measure this particular cell before the perturbation or after the perturbation, but you can't do both, right? Because again, the measurement is destructive to the cell. And so this you can see as a time um, problem as well, right? Either you do it at time point one before the perturbation or you do it at time point two after the perturbation. And so in all these problems, I think um, what, you know, what, what we try to do is, well, we have a whole population of cells um, that we care about, say this is maybe a particular cell type or a particular cell state. And you know, this, this population of cells evolves over time um, and, or it, you know, well, okay, it will always evolve over time. And so what you want to uh, do is, for example, take one of these cells out um, and now, you know, either you care about the time component or you want to just do something about different data modalities. So you take one of the cell point cells out, you put it, you take it for RNA sequencing, you take a different cell out, you take it for imaging. And I would really like to be able to predict, right? How would this particular cell have looked like? Were it also imaged? How would this particular cell look like? Would I be able to get its expression profile also at time point two? How would this cell have looked like? Were I able to measure it also after the perturbation that I care about. Okay, so these are the kinds of questions um, that I want to talk about here. And um, for all of them, we actually take um, a unified approach, um, which is, as Fabian said, something about optimal transport and actually autoencoders, which can also be seen as an optimal transport map. Um, so really um, what I want to um, introduce and what I'm going to be talking about here are autoencoders. Um, so these are just a special, um, you know, I'm sure like most of you are familiar with these networks um, since they've been used quite a bit now in single cell biology. Um, so these are neural networks. Um, they're maybe a bit special neural networks in that they're not the neural networks that you use for classification. They're the neural networks that go from, you know, some input space. So now let's think of an image to an other output space, which is the same dimension of the input space. Okay, so in this case, you know, you put in an image, um, 
say, you know, a very small image like 32 by 32 or a very large image, and out comes another image of size 32 by 32. Okay, or in goes a gene expression vector, say 20,000 dimensional, out comes another vector which is 20,000 dimensional. Um, and what are these autoencoders? So they, they consist really of two parts, uh, two neural networks um, that are stacked on top of each other, where here in the middle we have this latent space, which we're usually using for the analysis. Um, so if you're thinking of PCA, then PCA is a very simple one where, you know, we're getting some lower dimensional projection, right? And often we do the analysis in this lower dimensional projection in this PC space. Here, what we're doing is we again get some latent space there. Um, but, you know, now, of course, we have a nonlinear projection that goes into the latent space given by this neural network. And then we can, we can get back out to the original space here. Um, so how do you train these neural networks? Well, these neural networks are just uh, trained so that, you know, you have some training set of images or of RNA-seq. You put them all in and what you want that to come out is again the same image or as close as possible to the same image. So really all you're doing is you're just trying to minimize reconstruction error, okay? So I'm just minimizing here the reconstruction error. So this is, right, what comes out. So psi is the function that maps me forward. So psi of xi is just when I put in a training image, what comes out on the other side, and I want this to be looking like the training image that I put in. Okay, so these are autoencoders. They've been used all over the place, um, particular in vision, speech, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and here we'll see different kinds of applications of these to actually answer the questions that I had on the previous slide. Okay, so um, let's first just very briefly talk about the first problem of where I'm just using autoencoders, so I don't have a time component yet, um, to integrate different kinds of data modalities. So to really answer this question, you know, I have a population of cells, I take out some for imaging, some for, say, expression profiling, RNA-seq, and I want to then answer the question for a particular cell where I have the image, how would its um, expression profile look like? Or for a particular cell where you take the RNA-seq vector, how would the corresponding image look like? Okay, so how do we do this um, using an autoencoder? Um, so here is the main idea. Um, so these here, what you see here, are my different data modalities. Um, the nice thing is that this is modular. You can just add in your modalities whenever they come up. Um, so say this is imaging, this is RNA-seq, this is single cell high c this is CHIP-seq, um, anything you have. Um, and now um, what we're doing here is um, each one of these maps is an autoencoder, okay? So here you go from, say, imaging to some latent space back again to the image space, right? The same map as we had on the previous slide. Here as well, um, now we go from RNA-seq to latent space back again. And th the important thing is that you actually match to the same space, right? Because it is the same population of cells, right? Some I took out for imaging, some I took out for RNA sequencing. So what the, the distribution that I should get in the latent space is the same, right? So how do you enforce that the two distributions in the latent space are the same? Well, I'm not just going to minimize reconstruction error, but in addition, I'm going to add a discriminator in the latent space, which is just another classifier, which says, well, are you able to detect whether your sample comes from RNA-seq profile or whether it comes from imaging space? If you are able, then you know, you're going to be penalized because then the two distributions are not the same. Okay, so this will force, so this, this um, additional loss term will force the two distributions to be the same in the latent space. So then what that means is if I actually concatenate two functions, I can go from imaging to RNA-seq, right, at the single cell level. Um, and just to kind of show, I mean, just because, I mean, we did this for RNA-seq and, and here CHIP-seq and also for imaging on the next slide, we also validated this, but just so that, you know, it's a bit easier to see what is happening if I take different kinds of image modalities. Um, so here is what happens if, you know, one modality is black-haired women, one modality is blonde-haired women, the other modality is black-haired males, brown-haired male, blonde-haired males, etc. And so what you see here um, is, you know, these are all real images, okay? So this was trained, then I put in a new image, this black-haired woman, and I asked, well, how would she look like were she blonde? Okay, so then I map her to the latent space, back to the blonde space, and this is the generated image. Okay, this is not a real image. This is a generated image of how she would look like were she blonde. And the same question here is um, I'm asking how she would look like were she a male or how she would look like were she a blonde male. Okay, so that's how this works. And that's the same way how it also works for, you know, if you want to go from RNA-seq to CHIP-seq 
or, and this is what we also validated, oops, sorry, I'm jumping over. Um, this is also what we validated here of going from imaging space um, to RNA-seq space and, the, and, and backwards. Um, here we did this in naive T cells um, where, you know, it was already known uh, beforehand in a paper. So this is all in collaboration with Shiva's lab. Um, so Shiva's lab had this work where they looked at T cells and they found that there are two subpopulation of T cells. This was in mouse. Um, where in these naive T cells, CD4 plus naive T cells, there are two subpopulations where you see very clearly that um, one subpopulation has much more heterochromatin in the center of the cell nucleus, whereas another population has much more heterochromatin in the outside of the cell nucleus. And so we wondered if this is also the case in humans and whether, you know, we can then match what this actually means at the RNA-seq profile level. Okay, and so you see here that in humans, you actually also have these two subpopulations. So this is just from the DAPI stained images. If you look at the RNA-seq profile, you'll also very clearly see that there are two subpopulations. Um, so these are the naive ones here. Um, you see, if you do clustering in any way you want, actually, you'll always basically get the same uh, blue cluster and green cluster. Um, we call this green cluster because it's closer to the activated T cells, the poised naive T cells, and these ones, the more quiescent T cells. Um, you see this also here in the RNA-seq profile. And so now what we did is exactly this matching, right, of like, how do you match these images on one hand and this RNA-seq on the other hand in the latent space? Now, of course, you can ask, well, how are we ever going to validate this? We cannot get an image and RNA-seq profile of the same cell. So how can we validate it? Well, unfortunately, this means we can only validate it for very few uh, different kinds of proteins, right? So what we do is we take the images and we also stain for different kinds of proteins that really nicely, and here we just cho chose two of them that are the most differentially expressed in the two different groups um, and for which there are good fluorescence markers. So these were the two that we chose here. We also stain for them in the images. And now, of course, we can see whether, you know, we actually see a difference in the these two different kinds of um, subpopulations that we get here in the RNA-seq profile, and that's exactly what you get out. So these two can actually very easily or very well be used to actually cluster and classify the different kinds of cell populations. So this is one way how you can actually move uh, between different data modalities is just by actually um, coupling different kinds of autoencoders together in the latent space. Okay, so that's something about the power of autoencoders. Um, now, of course, if you think about um, images um, and, sorry, images and over time, right, so, so we care a lot about images because we care a lot about the packing of the DNA. Um, so now we would like to do the same question as we just had. Um, now, of course, okay, you can go between different data modalities, but I would also like to answer the question that we kind of had in Fabian's first um, in the introduction of like, hey, I give you an image at time point one. I would really like to know how this image looks like at time point two. And I'm sure you're, you have all seen this really nice work um, by Schiebinger et al. Um, out of the broad um, that was also in, in Fabian's um, introduction of actually using optimal transport uh, to move between different time points. So I have a cell population at time point one, a cell population at time point two. Um, how do I match between the two different um, populations or distributions? Well, there is a very um, well-known um, framework for doing this from statistics, which is known as optimal transport, which is just finding the transport map, you know, of moving from one distribution to another distribution that minimizes, in this case, a transport loss, um, which you can really just see it as, you know, an earth movers distance of like moving dirt from one end to the other end and just adding up how much, um, how much, how much, and now you need a distance measure, right? So how much distance you have to actually carry each one of your, say, sand corns, etc. Okay, so that's um, optimal transport, and this has been applied, as I said, for example, in this paper here um, for RNA-seq data. And now what we were wondering is, well, how can we do this for images, right? So we have a population of images at time point one, a population of images at time point two. Well, how can we predict, how can we map between different kinds of distributions? So, you know, what you need to define is this transport map, right? But to define a transport map, as I said, that depends on distances, right? So how do you define a distance between images is really the question. Um, because, you know, in a, in a microscopy image, right, pixel one has nothing to do with pixel one and the other map, 
or in the other microscopy image, right? These pixels don't correspond to each other. These cells can be in all kinds of different orientations. They can be a bit larger, a bit smaller, et cetera. So you can really not take like, like what you can do for RNA-seq, right? Gene one is gene one, gene two is gene two. So I can take some distance between these genes. But for images, you really cannot do that, right? You cannot take a distance between different kinds of pixels inside the image. So you need to kind of figure out how these things correspond to each other. Or again, using autoencoders, you can actually directly find a joint latent space, which is a joint coordinate system, right, for all of your images. And so here we did this um, for analyzing breast cancer prog progression. So think of, we have four different populations of cells there over time. Um, we also did it for actually the activation um, of cancer and fibroblasts, et cetera. So there we really had real time. Here, what I'm showing you is on cell lines, they kind of correspond to time um, in cancer progression. So we have normal, then we have fibrocystic, then we have the cancer state, then we have metastatic state. And so you have all of these images of these four populations of cells. Now, as I said, you know, doing optimal transport between them really doesn't give you anything reasonable. Um, so what we do here is um, we first map all these images. So here you have the four populations. So we first map them into a joint latent space. Now we have a joint coordinate system. And now we can just do optimal transport, right? Now in here, you can just do optimal transport to map between the different distributions. Um, and so now the autoencoder is super nice, right? Because I can take, um, this one here is in the metastatic state. I can take a particular cell, I can map it to the latent space. Now I can use my optimal transport to move backwards in time to whatever state you care about. Um, I get a point in the latent space and the autoencoder allows me to generate the corresponding image for this particular cell. Right? So what you can do here then is take a particular cell you care about, move it back in time in the latent space, and then actually generate a particular image corresponding to it. Um, so you get these kinds of movies um, that Fabian has shown um, now for images, and of course with, with um, a particular metric that you're, you're actually using here inside this latent space. Okay, so that's how you can get optimal transport to work also on images. Um, it, which really, I mean, you can try it out on the original images and you'll see it really doesn't work on the original images um, just because, you know, these, these images are really in like very, very different kinds of orientations and, and a pixel just doesn't say anything about the other pixel. Okay, so that's in terms of time. Um, so the last thing that I wanted to do is um, what I had on the slide is in terms of perturbations, right? So I would like to ask the question and here I'm asking, and Florian will know this very well, this little slide, because um, I, I uh, stole this picture here from, uh, from one of their papers. So what I want to ask, and this is motivated by COVID-19 is, you know, we have all these drugs, right? Um, and we have CMAP, which is a really, really nice um, data set where um, you have all these different drugs that have been applied to many different cell types. And, you know, if we think about repurposing, um, drug repurposing, in this case for COVID-19, we would really like to be able to predict for each one of these drugs, well, what would be its effect on the particular cells that we care about for this particular disease, right? These particular lung cells that we care about. Um, and so, you know, one approach of doing it now that we've seen that, you know, you just do everything like as, as arithmetics in the latent space is, you know, like what style transfer does is, you know, you take, you want to have, make a face be smiley. Um, so then um, you move these faces to the latent space, uh, you add this vector here that corresponds to making a face smiley to it, and out comes the smiley face. Right, and this was really nicely applied actually um, in this paper here um, for drugs, um, in this case for a particular drug uh, where you have two different cell types. Um, you look at the effect of this one drug in one cell type, you move over this effect um, to the second cell type, and this was actually validated also in this paper that you really get out um, something that looks like the second cell type under that drug, okay? So we wondered, I mean, we wonder in general whether this can be done in general. We know from causality that in general this cannot be done. Um, we know from Barr and Boyne Pearl's work, et cetera, that, you know, they have necessary and sufficient conditions when this causal transportability problem actually works. So you cannot expect this to always work. Um, it just works really nicely here. And we're wondering a bit, I mean, now here we have this huge data set, right? We can actually test this on many different cell types. Uh, Fabian, you're showing your face means that I should stop. 
No, you have one, two minutes. I'm just, you know. Two minutes. Okay. <laughs> Try to... <laughs> no, no, that's perfect. So let me do two okay, minutes. Right. Um, so um, we were wondering if this actually works here. Um, and so, I mean, I'll show you on the last slide that this in general doesn't work also on the CMAP data set and maybe just also a bit of intuition for why it doesn't work. Um, let me just tell you the following. Um, so because we do so much on autoencoders, we did wonder a bit about how do autoencoders work and when do they work? How do you choose the latent space dimension? What kind of network structure should you choose, etc.? So what we did is we also performed a, a theoretical analysis of autoencoders and what we proved is the following. So, you know, if you look at autoencoders, how they're very often used in the overparameterized setting, so you have more parameters than your samples. Well, that means that you can, and this is also what people do, right? You train, you really try to train to loss zero or as close as possible mm -hmm. to loss zero as you get. Um, and these, these autoencoders don't overfit, right? I mean, whatever overfitting means. So we were wondering what are the kinds of functions that autoencoders learn? Um, and so what you can show is the following. So you've probably, I mean, you've seen this, right? So if you, if you just train an autoencoder and you pr put in a new image, out comes some image that kind of looks similar to it, okay? But now you can do the following. You should once train an autoencoder just on one image and see what comes out. If you put in a random image, you'll actually see that always your training image comes out, okay? That you should just do once and you'll actually see that that happens. Of course, if you have many images, this doesn't usually happen, but you can do the following. You can take any image, put it through your autoencoder, something comes out that kind of looks like the original image, and now you iterate this map. Okay, since the autoencoder maps from RD to RD, I can just iterate the map, so I can put in the image again, put it in again, put it in again, and you'll see, and this is what we prove, that these autoencoders learn maps that are contractive at the training examples. So whatever you put in, out will come at a training example when you iterate the map. Okay, so these autoencoders, they can learn any map they like, but they're actually learning these maps that are strongly contractive at the training examples. Okay, and so if you want something to work, like um, what, was, what had worked here, where you need these kinds of vectors to be aligned with each other, um, what you actually really want to be using are these overparameterized networks. So these overparameterized networks where you have a huge, you know, very broad um, latent space, then in fact this will work well. In general, it won't work. Um, it will work like as good as if you actually don't use any embeddings. I won't go through it. We have all of this in the paper and also the theoretical explanation for it. But if you want to do any of this, you really should use these very highly overparameterized networks because they will align these effects in the latent space. Okay, so with that, um, this gives you some drugs um, for SARS-CoV-2, and with that, let me just end and acknowledge, you know, this would not have been possible without an amazing group of students and funding, um, uh, and a lot of people who are having fun with autoencoders and playing around with these. So Thanks, thank you Kyle. very much. Thanks for this very nice presentation, and, and I, I do like... I, I know it was due to time constraints that we had to move you to, to the first, but you know, I do like the style that different to other conferences where the computational and maybe theoretical part is usually put at the end. You know, let's start a bit with theoretical analysis of autoencoders and dictionary learning even like this overcomplete situation, very nice. We have time for questions. So people, maybe you can just please raise your hands in the chat and I should be able to figure out who has raised his or her hand. I don't exactly know how to do. But if not, someone can just put a cue in, in the question. So I do see that Volker Bergen does have a question. So if you just put a cue in the chat, that's equally well, because I haven't yet figured out how to sort by raised hand. Does someone know how to do it? Uh, can, uh, okay, I, I just, I'm, okay. Volker, you can ask a question. Yep, now it works. Hi. Perfect. Uh, you hear me, right? Yes. Um, that was that was really beautiful, Caroline. Thanks. Um, I really like the idea of uh, actually applying uh, optimal transport on image data and how, how you do that with, with the autoencoder. So in on single cell data, I uh, usually um, so it's kind of nice when you have your 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 time bonds nice to resolve. Like you have this very strong constraint on the time. What, uh -oh. what are you, I think you're cutting uh, off. Yeah. Um, when we really transport, we have like back. 
It doesn't. Can you hear me? Uh, no, we couldn't hear the that question. Was, uh, maybe turn off video and just say again shortly. If not, people just okay. put the question in chat. That's also nice. Yeah. So when, when things uh, go asynchronous, um, so when you have a, a quite a bit of like an overlap between time points, um, you may get an, like a transfer method uh, that might, so, because you have this very hard constraint on, on the time points, so you may get some backflows in, in the, in the uh, transfer method. But do you, do you have anything like related to, to your image data and how would you address it? Yeah, so I think it's a very, very interesting question. And this optimal transport is really to go between distributions, right? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so, so for now, I mean, I could only come up with heuristics to do it also using transport maps. You can, of course, move them around, right? Kind of like what you could do is something more um, like this. Oops. Uh, like okay, this. Okay, this right? is just so sh short. Because there's a few more people yeah. asking. You. Okay, so what you could do is just right? figure out these these mm. vectors here and move them around like that. Yeah. Very cool, Dominic. You had a short question. Short question, short answer, if possible. Yes. Uh, hi, Carolina. Thanks very much for the for the great talk. So I have a question regarding the first part of the multimodal integration. So you're saying that you kind of force um, uh, the cells to match from the different modes. So would the method be capable of dealing with cells with cell types or states that occur only in a single mode? Only, so you need to have at least two populations so that you can actually train these autoencoders. Yes, but, but then if you have, let's say, a number of different cell types and you perform chip seek, oh, single sure. cell RNA seek, and you have one of these states only as a contamination maybe in one of these modes, uh, would you see that as separate for that very mode or would you force it to match with another um, uh, cell type um, in another mode? Yeah, perfect, yeah. Okay, so, so things like this can be done. So what we're doing now is, for example, you have only a partially overlapping latent space. Um, so then actually some of the modalities, so this is when not everything will be shared between different modalities. The same here, I mean, usually you train it on very clean data, right, where I have the different clusters, I know how they match. So this is an additional loss function that you can put in. And then you add like your, you know, dirty data, and then you should still be able to see that you have different kinds of clusters. But if you train on it, then you, of course, have a problem there. I understand. Thanks. Next question by Tom. Tom, Tom. Uh, thank, thank you, Fabian, uh, for allowing me to uh, ask the question. And my question to Carolina, very, very fantastic presentation, uh, is um, you, you deal with the challenge of integrating multimodal um, data very well um, with the autoencoders. My question to you is, what happens when you, have two, when you have samples taken at two time points and you have one perturbation, so one drug given, how do you align that and would you would you sort of use the same approach? I mean, this question is to you as well, Fabian, because you, you sort of dealt with this in your um, April 2019 Nature Biotech uh, paper, we're using pseudodynamics. Um, would autoencoders be potentially another solution to resolving across those two time points or any other suggestions on resolving, answering that question? Um, so I didn't completely get the second part, but I can just say that for this, for these drugs, right, once you actually use these overparameterized settings, I mean, this is the nice thing that actually these drugs are just aligned, depending, it doesn't matter whether you can have two different time points. I mean, here we had many different cell types, et cetera, right? So I can move from one cell type to many other cell types via this very overparameterized setting where actually the effect of a drug will be aligned. So it will also be aligned over different time points. Um, and I, I understood this question like this, whether if I apply the drug in one time point, what, what can I say about applying it in a second time point or in a different uh, it's maybe, cell type? Let me make room for a last question, uh, jean Vieve, Stein, O'Brien, maybe? So my question's also on the multimodal integration. And I was wondering how um, you were able to overcome um, different like amount of information content almost it's almost a question of like relative k values in the different data types um i know like with high c data for example the amount of compression that you can do in that data type is incredibly high relative to rna seq so um was the nonlinearity of the auto encoders just able to overcome that or um, did you have to do any sort of data manipulation in yeah. order to get into a latent space? No, no. So this is the interesting thing about this versus, for example, Surat, right, where you first have to do the data manipulation to get them to the same dimension and then you can do this. So this autoencoder, you don't have to do any of that, right? I can use even a convolutional network for images and a fully connected one for RNA-seq. Mm -hmm. What you do is the latent space, the dimension of it has to be chosen well. So what we do first is 
we train on the images because those are much, they actually need more space than the latent mm -hmm. space. They're not as compressible than the RNA-seq. Um, so that defines us a latent space uh, dimension and then we match the RNA-seq to it. So you want to start with the most informative modality. Great, thank you. Thanks again, uh, Carol, for this really interesting uh, um, talk, enjoyed discussion. I hope we have time for maybe a few online discussions. We just basically generate a new Slack, I heard from, this, from the community. Thanks, guys. People try to hang out by that. And if not, I'm sure Carol is up to some questions by email.